uh, we, are, we are lucky people. And uh, just to prove how lucky we are, we're going to shine lights in the faces of uh, Liz Lesner. Oh, I need those uh, slides, so this is the time. Uh, we have uh, two guests with us, and we are, couldn't be uh, happier and luckier. Uh, Liz Lesner uh, at Betty's Family of Restaurants. Uh, I, I, I know particularly, oh, I know, right? <laughs> These restaurants are unspeakably smart, right? They're, like, they're just, you go in and you say, well, that makes sense. And it, it's, uh, it's uh, what are they, Betty's and the Surly Girl and uh, Tip Top. And my personal favorite is, is Dirty Frank's. Uh, <laughs> what a great, right. What a great idea to have a laser pointer that, uh, uh, right behind Liz is a line of, oh, right, actually right here. There's a line of people that are uh, <laughs> waiting, waiting to go in. To Liz's restaurant. Uh, we're so grateful to you for uh, creating these restaurants. It's, uh, uh, it's just nice to, and I have, I've always wondered, so what is it about these restaurants? How, how does a person keep coming up with these ideas? I want to find out more about that because there are more to come. Apparently, she keeps coming up with ideas. So Liz Lesner is here, and we're, we're happy about that. We also have Pete Scantlin, who has done, in, in, oh, oh, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> It's funny. I mean, I think you go to your websites and you don't find the two of you. Uh, in fact, if you look, if you Google Pete Scantlin, this event comes up. Right? It's the only thing, right? That it's like he's done nothing in his life except come here today. And uh, but that's not true. Pete's also a trustee here at the Columbus Museum of Art on, on your board of directors, uh, board of trustees, and has created this th these landmark advertisements. Right? They're landmarks. Go to the soccer ball and turn right. And and when uh, when Coop. Paints uh, created this, you know, frankly fraudulent uh, advertisement that dumped paint all over it uh, for the sake of Nationwide. Brilliant, wonderful, and advertising suddenly is what it really can be, which is engaging and, and joyous and memorable and attention-getting. And that's enough. So, so now we'll go back to the, the slides uh, that don't shine in the eyes of our victims. Thank you. Okay, great. So we're here with Liz and Pete, and I just thought we'd ask questions. Of, uh, of them along the lines of how do you, how do, you do this? How, how is it you're creative? What, what, what do you do? We're not necessarily looking for philosophy, I told them, or but could be, happy to have some, or, or, or just tactical things. What happens? So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's looking at me. So that was a question. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> Liz, uh, first of all, is there anything you'd like to say just by way of uh, how do you do? Oh, um, thanks for having us. I'm, I'm really honored to be here. Okay, good. <laughs> that was a how do you do. So now the question is, uh, <laughs> th the basic question. You seem, just from looking at your product, to be a tremendously creative person. Where does it come from? How do you do it? Where does it come from? Um, it comes from looking at, at sort of what's lacking in the landscape in the restaurant scene. Um, all of us love to eat out. We eat out three times, or we eat three times a day, so it's a necessity in our life. And um, when I visit other cities, uh, there's things that I see, there's things that I like, and uh, I see them missing. And uh, I kind of want them here in my life. Um, what we do is very DIY, um, and it's driven by lack do of- Do it yourself. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's driven by lack of, of money, <laughs> quite <laughs> frankly. Um, when you're poor, when you don't have funding, uh, especially early on in the restaurants, um, when you're a 27-year-old young woman and my, my education was limited and my experience was just restaurants, uh, no bank is real interested in talking to you. So you, you have to do what you can. So um, a lot of our, our decorating, a lot of our ideas, we didn't have money to hire experts, so we had to kind of become our own expert. And um, I, I tell you what, being scared, taking risks are the types of things that really can drive creativity. I think that needing things is what makes people creative, and I, th I think that that's good. Necessity is the mother of invention. Absolutely. And uh, isn't she great? <laughs> I mean, seriously, this is unbelievable. Uh, Pete, what, where does it come from? Where, where does your creativity, you're not scared like Liz, what's the deal? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I think that there's, it, it comes from a lot of places, and I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that um, in, in almost all cases, at least in, in, my, in my case, it's really a collaborative process among um, not only me and, and my team, but um, whomever our, our client is, whomever, whomever our partner is, um, what are our goals, and then sort of, um, like Liz said, we try to find the best solution to, um, with a, a limited set of, 
of resources and um, parameters around a, a project. Um, in, in terms of, of individual creativity, um, I, I, you know, I think you, uh, you spelled it out earlier. Um, it's about um, allowing yourself the freedom and the opportunity to, um, to think. Um, Personally, I, I end up doing it on um, places where I'm not getting disturbed. Airline, for example, um, which happens four or five times a week. Um, my phone stops ringing. Generally, I'm able to ignore the person next to me, and, um, and I have a couple uninterrupted hours. Or in my car, um, to the detriment of other motorists, I guess. <laughs> I'm, um, <laughs> I'm usually lost at thought. So, okay, let's, uh, there's lots of ways to go with this. Uh, Pete, Liz described her creative process as, as basically stealing and fraud from other towns. I, uh, <laughs> we'll get back to you, Liz, in just a moment. I, uh, I, I, you can't go to other towns and look for these ideas because you're, you're creating something that just hasn't been done. I, I, I want to know, I mean, in any of the cases, like we showed the soccer ball popping out of the, where does that, where, how does that come up? How, what happened? Um, well, in, in the case of the soccer ball, um, we had a client, the Columbus crew, who wanted to announce that um, the team was w was coming back to town, create some excitement. And so um, what we w decided was we would come up with a narrative about the crew. And the idea um, was that um, a player had kicked it up into the building and smashed the walls, and, um, and they were back from winter training, essentially. Um, and so... Um, we tried to reinforce that in the press. Um, we developed a whole story around it that made it, um, tried to create a conversation about the team rather than just um, create advertising. So that's what we ended that's up with. That's fabulous. Uh, Liz, this, this narrative, is there a story about the restaurants? Oh, yeah, there's a story about every restaurant. Um, absolutely. Um, it's important to us that we fit into the community that, that we go into. Um, and that we also relate to one another. Um, we call it the family of restaurants, which is really an internal term, um, because each, each restaurant has a relationship to, to one another. Um, Betty's was my very first restaurant, so... Um, this is in the short north on High Street. It's in the short north on High Street, and we took it very seriously. Um, it was important to break into the scene. Um, but by the time Surly Girl Saloon came around, uh, it was really fun not to be able to take ourselves so seriously and let our hair down and, and just be kind of... Uh, wild and, and, and raucous. Um, well, wait, so, so, so Surly Girl, you know, you're, you're a little bit more relaxed because Betty's is, is chugging along. You, you're designing Surly Girl. Do you, do you have a, uh, like, like Pete describes, a, a narrative or a, a story that, how did it start? How did, how did you, end, I mean, you saw, you didn't just see Surly Girl in Pittsburgh. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> Did you? No, no, no. no. <laughs> it was actually. That was just a shot in these, the dark. I no, mean, these these things these th uh, they're often reactions. Um, when Surly Girl opened, uh, the the martini craze was very was very high, and there's a lot of just kind of. Uh, sort of an air of pretension happening in the short north with a lot of the gentrification. And, and uh, our, our goal... You know who you are. <laughs> our, our goal really and truly in those early planning meetings was to bring the low brow back to High Street. That was really important to us. And uh, <laughs> Again, it's, it's responding to the environment that you're in. We're watching, and I'm like, gosh, you know, you think about the short north and the history, and it's, it's beautiful and it's wonderful. And we really wanted to embrace the past that was there um, and also fit in so that the clientele that now frequents it. But uh, something that happens in Columbus is a building gets torn down and a shiny new one goes up. And, and that's something we don't, we don't like to see, especially in our historic neighborhoods. Um, the Surly Girl Saloon, the building that it's in, uh, we, we looked up the history and we were able to find out that um, a long time ago when it was the Garden District, it, it was a brothel. Um, unfortunately, in a sadder time, the 70s, it was also, you know, a, pro it was a place where prostitution happened. And um, as sad as that was, or rough as that was to look at, we, we thought, that's part of our history. So we, we gave it that sort of uh, bordello saloon look. We thought that that was, that was important, um, to honor the district, not pretend that the Garden District is, is what it is today, but remember where it's been and uh, have some fun with it. Um, 
So that's, that's kind of where that, that came from, was really uh, responding to what was happening at that time in the short north. And uh, it, it's been kind of fun. Now the area has really come up. If you look across the street, there's this new condo development called the Jackson. And it's just, you know, half million dollar condos. And when, when we moved in there just, just, a few, just a few years ago, it's only been five years, I mean, it, it was scary, <laughs> some of the stuff going on around. So um, it's important to us to embrace. We, we just uh, purchased the jury room, which is Columbus's uh, oldest continuously operating bar. It's, it's been running since 1831. Can I just um, say about it? My father and I, when, I, when my father, blessed memory, we took a field trip once. We went to the Franklin County lockup just to take a tour. I don't know who does this, but yeah. we, did, we did that. <laughs> and, then we, and then we went to the jury room, and in the jury yeah. room, we're drinking a beer, and my father says, now I've been to two places I never want to come back to. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> So I'm glad. This is great. You're yeah, going to make it. Yeah, right? we, we just bought it. But there, there is um, Columbus, I think, gets disconnected to, to its history. And I, we've got some great history. Um, I've, I lived for a while on the West Coast, and I've lived in other parts of, uh, of the country, Charlotte, North Carolina, where they don't really have a past. But Columbus has a past. And, and one of the things that we always try to do is, is cling on to that uh, however we can. So That's great. So I didn't think that I, – I didn't know we'd like – charge after narratives here, but it sounds like it's a, you are uh, storytellers masquerading as advertising and restaurateurs, right, in some ways, or you're, you're in the historic preservation business. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> the, the demented and twisted. Great, story. okay. <laughs> I, I think as, as um, people, you know, in the case of, of, of Liz, the popularity of Liz's restaurants are testament to the fact that people want to have um, a connection to something beyond just um, you meant the marti the sort of cold and, and you know the 1999 to 2002 martini bar craze. Um, you know, I don't think uh, I don't think people responded to it, and you know they're all gone now, or essentially gone, which is partially I think due to the. Um, collapse of our economy and partially due to the fact that um, we're drinking at home that <laughs> <laughs> the, the, those folks have moved down in, into the basement um, <laughs> the um, it, it, people want to people want to um, feel connected to something and they want a sense of, of history and they want a sense of how they got there um, and that can be either um, true in the case of many of Liz's places or manufactured in the case of um, you know, Abercrombie and Fitch is the perfect example of this. Um, you know, one of the most successful retailers based right here in Columbus, um, in the country, and um, has in all of their brands and most successful retailers come up with some sort of a story about how we got here. In the case of Abercrombie and Fitch, um, some of it was true. They were sort of an Upper East Side adventure outfitter, but. Um, to their credit, they've done a, a wonderful job of convincing 13-year-olds across America um, <laughs> to beg their parents for their clothes because they want that sense of authenticity and that sense of um, that sense of qual quality. Um, <laughs> tr whether it, not there, but right. um, but is <laughs> but is um, but is is um, is reinforced by the idea that they were outfitting Ernest Hemingway. Right. So. So if you want your kid to be like Papa, this is the way to make it happen. <laughs> right. um, talk to me about the creative process. So uh, whether it's a narrative or just this, this idea that well, we want to look into this building, we want to find out what that's like. Uh, who's sitting around the table? You're on an airplane. You're alone. Oh, let's focus on that just for a second. It seems like you're creative uh, when you're held hostage. Right? That's, that's, what you're, that's what you're saying. And so as, as airplanes get uh, to be wired, which is, you know, a, a matter of days, and the car becomes more wired and... Are you gonna? What are you gonna do about this, pal? <laughs> um, Will you lose it? No, I think you know. I, I think, as as I said, I think there's there's really two types of, of of creativity, and and for the most part, you know, I think people, and certainly I am, um, most productive when I'm collaborating with others, um, and I think in almost um, certainly in in most business endeavors, um, it is. Um, essential um, because there's just too much to do um, and generally speaking um, I think my I see my role is to sort of set the tone of, of who we the vision maybe um, I think not that I'm visionary but someone's got to come up with why what we're what we're doing and um, and and come up with sort of um, the general um, 
parameters and our, our mission, essentially. And then um, help as needed or get out of the way with, um, with the others to, um, to, to implement it. What resources do they demand and which ones would they wish you didn't saddle them with? Do they ever talk about the tools they want to be creative? I, actually, it, um, I, I, I read an article the other day. I, th or I may have heard it on NPR. Um, <laughs> oh, um, then must be right. Yeah. Go about <laughs> about it, I, I think it was an excerpt from a um, it was an academic study on management. It may have been Harvard Business Review or one of those. And um, and the the gist of the article was that um, managers generally misallocate resources by expecting expecting their employees to accomplish two different types of tasks. Um, what are called star tasks, which are um, what you might consider the leader of a company to do or the uh, uh, vice president of a company to do, a leader, um, a manager of other people, and then um, guardian tasks. And I'd never heard either, either of these terms before. Um, but what was interesting about it was that um, by almost um, any measure, certain people are better equipped to perform star tasks, and other people are better equipped to perform guardian tasks. That's why... Uh, What's a star task? So a star task um, might be, for example, um, deciding we're going to go into this type of business, um, or setting up a deal, a very important deal that um, is a, a change of direction for the company. So time out for a second. Pretend I'm walking away. The... Uh, you're wondering, what's this have to do with me? I might not be a manager of a business. This seems completely corporate and irrelevant. But actually, <laughs> but no, actually, you are both of these people, right? You are the star that's trying to figure out, I'm now going to work in this medium. I'm now going to try this thing. I'm going to walk in those woods. I'm going to do this thing. And then you also have to be the guardian, just switching on and off. Go ahead, please. And, and then the guardian tasks are the day-to-day -day operation of whatever you're doing. And as... To, to your point, you know, this could be business related, it could be household related, um, it could be um, just personal uh, management of your life related. Um, but things like making sure that bills get paid and making sure that, um, you know, uh, money gets deposited in the bank or um, someone mows the lawn, you know, things that are um, generally routine, I think, is the, is the, uh, the difference and and trying to assign both those tasks to the same people generally stifles them because right. um, certain people get frustrated with routine and certain people aren't capable or un, or are re probably rather more uncomfortable um, doing things that um, that deviate from a standard. So you don't want to be saddled with both of these because you've just heard that's a recipe for failure. What what you can do is to say on certain days I'm going to be a star and on certain days I'm going to be a guardian. Because you know what otherwise happens. We drown in guardianship. We pay our bills and check our email and update our Facebook all the time to the point where we never really think about the big picture. You have a question? <laughs> Great. Nice. <laughs> nice. Excellent. Right. Perfect. Yes? So, Liz, tell I, us about your creative process. What, what, who's sitting around the table? What happens? Um... Liquor. It involves liquor. <laughs> <laughs> Everything starts and ends me, with me liquor. Too. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Forget what I said earlier. Um, creatively, uh, it's knowing what your strengths are. It's knowing what you're good at. It's exactly what Pete's talking about. Um, understanding the tasks that I'm really bad at. and um, What are those? The Guardian, everything. Paying bills and accounting and getting to the bank and... Um, everything routine, I'm, I'm pretty bad at. <laughs> um, but it's uh, it's why you hire people. The, one of the first the first big hire that I made was was a bookkeeper because I just would I didn't want to sit down and figure all this stuff out. So um, figuring out what your strengths are, and then when we come up with each restaurant, uh, when we determine a location, the first thing I do is walk the block. I walk around and around and around all hours of the day, all hours of the night, um, enough to rise suspicions. <laughs> um, what the hell is she doing? Um, but really get to know the neighborhood, really get to know what's going on. Um, you know, one of the things I did, um, Tip Top is, is our restaurant downtown on Gay Street. And um, I was a little bit scared to go in there. I was, it was a little bit too early. Um, I had just opened Surly Girl, but we had a really good opportunity that the person selling us the building really wanted us in there. So 
you know, I was looking at the location, um, and at that time, downtown was was pretty scary place to go. I mean, now I'm, I have three restaurants down there, but at that time, it was our first venture. The Short North, you kind of know you can be a success. Um, there's enough foot traffic and, and everything there. But I remember looking, you know, across the street at Vori's Law Firm and seeing That's all the scary. seeing all the lawyers. <laughs> but but in my head, I was like, gosh, if I'm a partner at Vori's, I can eat anywhere on the street. You've got Mitchell's Steakhouse, you have Dewey Amici, you have all these nice places. But what about all the support staff, which are you know thousands of people that, that work? And I was like, they've got Subway, you know. So so I really built Tip Top to kind accommodate to to the working class person in on Gay Street. And, and it was a success. One of the happiest moments I ever had at um, Tip Top was I was uh, working hosting at lunch one time, and um, there was the partners at Vori's, and it was a Friday, and then there was you know all their secretaries over here at a table, and they wanted beers, and they asked us to put them in the red soda cups so that their bosses <laughs> over there. And I was like, yes, I've scored, because because my goal really is is to to get everybody drinking, drinking, <laughs> and spending money on drinks. So so it's it's been. A lot of that process is, is identifying who your customer is, who's around, and, and how are you going to sort of inspire them to come through your doors and spend money and drink beer. Um, and we've, we've done that on that street. That was a, that was a good success. Um, the process usually involves knowing the neighborhood, knowing what I want, knowing what the needs are, um, what is unique, what, what can we do that's unique here, what can we do that hasn't been done here. Um, none of my restaurants sell hamburgers. They just don't. Um, Tip Top, our third restaurant, was the first one to sell French fries. We thought, God, how many times can you redo a hamburger? And yes, they're delicious, but we don't need any more hamburgers. So it's just always looking for ways to be a little bit interesting. Be a we little as a society don't need any more hamburgers? No, I don't think so. I mean, okay. there's plenty. I mean, we've got lots of options. We're covered. Um, but, and that's just my own... That's only my sure. opinion. But, um, so that's part of the process. But then the, the really... So that's sort of the work part of the process. But where it really comes in is grabbing my partner, grabbing my team... I've got um, uh, co-owners of the restaurants. Then we go and we drink, and we go to a place like O'Reilly's Pub in Clintonville, and we have beers, and we just kind of brainstorm. What do we want to do? What do we need? And that's where you get really dumb ideas, like uh, when we opened the hot dog shop, um, we put in a slushy machine, but that wasn't enough. We had to do boozy slushies. We had to have <laughs> vodka in the slushies. And, and those are the, the goofy ideas you come up, um, because we, we think you know eating out should be fun. Um, when I was a kid, and I think most of us... Um, that are that are older, we didn't grow up eating out a lot. That's more of a, a more recent thing, but it was a fun time for me. We went out um, maybe for pizza as kids once a month, once maybe every couple months. We just couldn't afford to eat out, so it was a really joyous occasion. And to me, that's something I always want to bring back to people. Like, let's remember when eating out was fun, you know? Because there's nothing that's harder as a as a server to wait on people that are unhappy. So how do we make this fun and exciting? Because eating out should be so. So That's you're the a process. therapist masquerading as a restaurateur. Not at all. Yeah. <laughs> just, just pushing booze. booze okay, pusher. great. <laughs> drug, drug pusher. I, I, think a, I, I think a common thread, aside from, um, aside from the alcohol, um, is um, in both Liz and I's <laughs> businesses is um, trying to, but really probably out of economic necessity, um, trying to do something in a different, in a different way. Um, you know, if Liz would have opened up the next, you know, the next hamburger restaurant, um, there's, a, as she said, there's thousands of them. It's hard to, it's hard to compete. But there's truly nothing like the Surly Girl or like Betty's or like the Tip Top. Um, in the case of my business, um, I spend now um, the majority of my time working with um, cities and zoning authorities and attorneys on, um, on allowing what we do in other markets and 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 the reason we try to do something and, and we could go to um, a city and do what's already being done but um, it's not going to be effective for us to to compete that way and so um, you know we we have billion dollar competitors and then we're a small little outfit in Columbus um, and I think that what's the most creative thing um, that we do and I think that um, when you interviewed me earlier and I told you who I thought, what the characteristics of creativity were, I think that um, probably the biggest one is a, either an unwillingness or a, a reluctance to follow the status quo. Um, and so um, to look at things, doing things differently, and, and to say, just because it's always been done this way doesn't mean it has to continue. Yeah, I think right. you described it at the time, as a, and this is on a podcast that you can be uh, sent, uh, you described it as a, uh, almost a... a, a 
was like a disagreeable feeling. It was a disgust with the way that the world is. Yeah, I, I, I think he used more I, polite language, but it was just, yeah. you know, <laughs> uncomfortable. You're uncomfortable with the, with the status quo. Yeah, I think that that's in, it, I think that that is a characteristic that you will find in almost any, um, a, any creative person um, is a, you know, whether it comes naturally, and I think you, it can be trained, and I think it can be learned, um, but a, um, a belief that just because it's always been so doesn't mean it has to continue to be. And then also, I think a, 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 um, a discomfort with, with problems, and a, and a, but an understanding that there's gonna be problems and a willingness to try and solve them. And I think that those are the, um, the tenets that, um, that form the basis for being creative. So this is, this is directly applicable, right? You wake up, you, you walk about your life, and you decide, what is it that I, I find uh, disagreeable. What do I? F what, what makes me uncomfortable? What seems broken in this world? Let's let me let me focus on that. It's worth a day to try to find that challenge. That's the star, and then the guardian starts to put some resources around that. Uh, what's the most cr when something happens and you do something well and it's creative and you know it's a soccer ball or the dirty Frank's hot dog palace opens up? Uh, there must be sort of a joyful feeling. Or is it just, <laughs> or are you just so absorbed by the work of it all? No, I, I'm wondering. I'm wondering what, what does that feel like, and how do you how do you celebrate? But I know how you celebrate. The. Uh... <laughs> What's funny is I don't really drink. Oh well, I know. <laughs> I talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> Drinking as a met we drink metaphor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> metaphor brand. Uh, so, what 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 happens? How do you celebrate the uh, the opening, the the unveiling, which? You know, it's it's the cr being creative is so exciting to me that you don't really want it to end, so it's a little more sad than celebratory. You're kind of ready for the next project. That's how I feel. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, we're generally on to sort of the next, not that we don't celebrate our successes, and I think, you know, the the, the biggest thing for me is, um, is you know, um, is seeing it out in public and, and realizing the... Um, um, you know, the impact, how many people are going to see it, that kind of thing. I think that's what drives us and compels us to try to, to do new things. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, I consider the creative process an, a, a, an ongoing one um, where, you know, we're continuing to, to do things. Um, and once we've done one project, doesn't mean we stop, um, but we keep going on whatever else we're Great. doing. So we're, let's turn up the house lights. I'll ask one more question, then you get to ask questions. Uh, my last question, uh, as far as I know, is what do you do individually to, and I think you might have already answered this, uh, uh, Pete, and you talked about walking around the block, but I'm sort of interested in uh, what do you do when life is uh, complex and busy? What do you do to unplug? What do you do to get away in order to restore your sanity and your creativity? Um, I physically get away. <laughs> My husband and I spend a lot of time in the Hocking Hills, and it, it just, uh, it, it's nice when you're in a place that doesn't have cell phone reception. Um. <laughs> someone mentioned that, actually, during the break. Someone said there were nine people out in the uh, sculpture garden, and four, five of them were doing this. Yeah. And, and his comment was, what's so important? I mean, what's, what, what's really so interesting about that when here we are in a group of people? Yeah. It, it absorbs you, right? You, you can't help. It, it does. It's, you know, being uh, in Columbus can, can just be hard because it's too accessible. Uh, everything is just, you know, you are really plugged in here. So um, I go until there's no cell phone reception. <laughs> go in the middle of the lake when you're kayaking, you can't. Right. Nobody can find you. You so talk to nice. people in the call, until <laughs> the call is dropped and exactly. then you can work. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I, I, I think you have to absolutely have to get away. Um, sadly, um, airplanes have now started to roll out Wi-Fi. Um, and I was on an Amtrak train a couple weeks ago where almost everyone on the entire, I had to go to the quiet car, almost everyone in the entire place was on their cell phone. And um, I just read that the, um, the metro in DC and in New York are about to roll out um, cell phone repeaters throughout the track so that people can be on their phone in, in the subway. So I think it, it will... Um, it's not enough to get knifed in the subway. <laughs> <laughs> um, now technology, now technology will continue both, you know, and it's, and it's, some, it's great that, you know, you could, in theory, go, Liz could, in theory, go 
um, live her life in the Hocking Hills and be in touch with people she needed to be in touch with, which is great. Um, unfortunately, they can also be in touch with her. Um, <laughs> with, so, um, you know, I think that a big part of it is literally checking out um, and, and, and allocating your time so that you can get, um, you, you can do what you want to do. Um, it'll be an interesting challenge for me. I'm going on my honeymoon on Sunday. Um, and, <laughs> and I now, I have a, um, there's a bet going in the office on whether I bring my computer and cell phone. And I have... <laughs> Dude, can I give you some advice? <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> and there are certainly... There are certainly lots of um, lots of great things, uh, unbelievably great things to do, and I think I'm gonna I'm probably gonna leave it for the first time. So it should be uh, awesome. should be pretty. Tell awesome. you what, leave it. Yeah. <laughs> leave it with me. I'll pretend I'm you. <laughs> right. That'll. You can win your bet on both sides. Perfect. There. Have your cake and eat it too. The. Uh, so questions, uh, thoughts? Yeah, please, Cleve. Oh, look, there's a microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, Two-part two question. Am I, am you're I on. live? Thank you, you're live. Yeah, yeah. What is it about Columbus that has allowed you to be creative, and what one thing would make this community even more creative? Um, Columbus is the only... I, I'm from Chicago, and I spent my college years in San Francisco. Um, Columbus is the only place that I really could have afforded um, to do... What I wanted to do, I, you know, you, you can you can buy a home um, when you're in your 20s in Columbus, which I know you can't do in other cities. Um, that's the only way that I was able to get access to lending. Um, I think a lot of it is accessibility, and it's also the climate of the people. I think that everyone here really wants you to succeed. I, didn't, I don't feel a, a strong type of competition with, with anyone. I'm friends with just about every competitive restaurant. Or, you know, the owners are, are good friends. Um, so I think that the spirit here really encourages you to succeed, you know. It's funny, I'm, I'm on the, this double secret uh, advisory board of Cat Singer's Deli. And, uh, <laughs> and a, a couple years ago, uh, we, we were talking about well, what ideas do we need? A recession coming on. We ought to have, hot dogs are cheap. Let's, let's, let's serve hot dogs. It'd be a good recession restaurant. And Diane said, no, 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 no. My friend Liz Lesner, who at that point I did not she's know a you, good friend. she <laughs> said, uh, no, no, Liz, I, I, Liz told me she's coming out with that. We, I said, well, so this is great. We can, we can crush Liz. Right? <laughs> this is, uh, right? Uh. She said, no, no, it's not. Diane's very vicious. That's, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, not, that's not the way it works. And, and I, I think that's absolutely true. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Pete? Um, one of the most marked characteristics I've noticed in between Columbus and, and other cities, and to a, a, a large extent, that's sort of where at least our business is, is heading, um, is that there is a real, um, there's a real, uh, almost like um, there's, there's a culture of wanting people to do, th do things here. Um, whereas, um, and, and part of that I think, unfortunately, is, is driven by, um, there's a shortage of people who want to do something here. Um, there's a, sh <laughs> seriously, there is. There's a, short, there's, a, um, there's a shortage of people who want to build a building. There's a shortage of people who want to um, open a restaurant. There's a shortage of people who um, are going to start the next um, Google. Um, and in, you know, um, in Boston, that's not, that's not necessarily the case. So, that, so what you have in Columbus is a really um, a, um, the environment that, um, that's from the, from the mayor down through city government, through um, many of the support groups and ba even banks, frankly, um, that are, have a um, an interest in helping people get something going, and that's very. But you don't have the people asking for the help to get it going. You, I, I think that there's. I, I think the what Columbus probably needs is, um, you know, I think that there's the environment here. I think, frankly, there needs to be more. Um, a, a better effort to um, to publicize it. Great. So, so welcome to the Center for Creativity. Right. Yeah. This is this is the idea behind this massive, wonderful renovation. How can we create a a place, a tank for people to figure out what what's my ambition? What am I going to do? Because as you're saying, this is a good place to to start that business. Great question. It's a good place to start the business. We need the risk taking entrepreneurs. We need people to say. And, is that what you're saying? Yeah, not, and not just entrepreneurs. I mean, yeah. you know, um, artists and other people who are going to come here and create something, um, which, you know, is in Columbus, I think, is an exemplary place to do it, but people don't know about it. 
Um, and the one, I guess, to answer the second part of your of, of your um, question, Cleve, is I, I think that there are certain um, limitations on what Columbus is ever going to be good for, um, and we need to acknowledge that. For for instance, um, if uh, I know I'm going to get flack here for this, but I'll be honest about it. Um, if I were a if I were a visual artist um, who wanted to have a career in fine arts, it would be very difficult to have one um, in Columbus. Um, now, if a career is a commercial artist selling at galleries in Columbus, you could live here, but... And there are examples of those who've done it. And there's examples, and you know, there's plenty of... Uh, uh, Mina Robinson would be a, a great example of that. Sure, Paul um, Hamilton or but Adam there But there is not the market, and it's not just Columbus, it's almost any city outside of New York and Los Angeles, you know, in the United States. Um, there are, and, and in my business, for example, advertising, um, you know, the centers of advertising are, it's very unlikely that it will ever be Columbus. It's crazy to run an ad agency in this town. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, but you can be successful in advertising No, here. you can't. <laughs> 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 Go ahead. Sorry, uh, and you can be su you can be successful as an artist, but you need to learn to adapt to to understand the realities of what uh, of what you can accomplish here and how you have to do it, and, and frankly, how you have to also work outside of Columbus, um, which you know I think most people have, have started to, to look at. Great. Other other questions. Okay, we have to get a microphone. Whoever you go to, uh, uh, you, you're in charge. interested in hearing both of you speak about uh, influences in your childhood that looking back you think th these are the things that influenced me to be creative, to be a confident risk taker. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts about that. Uh, so the question was, uh, tell us something about your childhood that uh, perhaps sets you on a path uh, towards creativity and risk taking. It's a really easy one for me to answer. I, um, I always... I, this happens not on purpose, but I seem to really get in touch with my inner 16-year-old. <laughs> um, and I, I think that in it's business... It's not that far away. It's there, not, yeah, yeah, right. It's not at all. Um, <laughs> it's really important that you take risks. It's really important that you have fearlessness. It's really important that you don't care what anyone says. I've gone to banks and presented ideas, and they've laughed in my face and said, hell no, um, to loans that I've asked for. And, and I think that just embracing that part of me has really helped me to be successful and, you know, when we were opening Surly Girls Saloon, some of the things that we had thought we were going to do were, were pretty shocking. Um, but I think it's important to, to embrace that part of me. And I... Um, what was the experience, though, when you were 16 that you were, you were tapping into? Oh, just that angsty, pissy, surly kid. <laughs> you haven't lost it, Liz. Not I at want you all. To know. Not at all. <laughs> and, and also maybe the, the um, you know, the, uh, teenagers don't like to be told no. And they will find a way to get that answer to be yes, whether it's just being really annoying or, you know, nudging forward. But that, that fearlessness, um, you lose it as an adult, and I think it's important not to. I, I think that a, a big part for me, a big part of it, I have to, you know, credit my parents. Um, one thing I remember vividly was um, I was, from a very young age, a big drawer. And, um, and I remember my mom literally... I, th I think I, she let me borrow my dad's briefcase. I loaded up my drawings, and she took me to a couple galleries to see if they were interested in buying my, <laughs> my drawings. <laughs> well, well, when, what when, was this? Was this a realistic idea? No, absolutely not. You know, I was 10 years old, and they were terrible. That's awesome. Um, and she did it with a straight face, and, with, you know, I'm sure she, inside she was humiliated, but she cer certainly didn't let me know about it. Um, and so... Did she, was this her get-rich-quick scheme? I mean, what's going on? <laughs> Um, awesome. I think that, um, you know, and I think that, uh, um, and throughout my, um, you know, I was, a, I was an art major in college, and, um, and most of my friends were business. In fact, most of the, you know, most of, um, and a lot of people sort of asked why would I be an art major. I never planned on being a, a, a fine artist. Um, but I thought it was an interesting, you know, to me, some of, um, you know, the things that you learn in being a communications major, for example, are kind of intuitive. And being an, an art major exposed you to a different viewpoint and was a, um, and frankly, was a lot more interesting. 
um, way to spend four years of college. So, so. Who, who has the next question? If we get the microphone there, I would just say that you can imagine these moments, this great question that was just asked. You can imagine these moments where, you know, uh, little Pete is told briefcases are things you throw your drawings into and you take places and you show them to people. And maybe they'll pay you, and maybe they won't, but let's give it a go, right? I mean, there's this, there's this moment where little Pete says, okay, <laughs> you know? And Liz is told, we're going out to dinner. This came up early. We're going out to dinner. We don't get to go out to dinner all the time, you know? And this is going to be a fun time. And, and little Liz says, all right, right? And these are huge moments. And we don't know which moments they are until they happen, right? So who's next? You were supposed to be doing that. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> to play off that last question about your own childhood, um, and I don't know if either of you have children, or, so don't take it this way. Um, but if you were to give advice to school leaders, educators, and people that are funding or supporting them, and you had two objectives. One is inspire the potential for creative outcomes. And two, we want our graduates to be strategic about how they play a role in the world, whether it's for-profit, non-profit, life, business leader, whatever. What advice would you give to them to make it more likely that more young people or older people would graduate being both creative and also able to strategically find a role in society in Columbus, et cetera, with those talents? I just think there needs to be more engagement um, between, between students and between the adult world. Um, but I think I'm a really bad person to ask. I, I really, I wasn't a good student ever. Um, I, I never finished college. Um, I was really not interested in school. It was sort of like torture to me. Um, I have, I'm, I don't have children, but I have um, nieces, I have nephews, and, and a lot of my uh, coworkers have children, and um, it's, it's just tough. There's, there's not enough engagement. There's not enough hands-on anything, is, is my thoughts. I can, I can just hear Mim Shenfield. She's, I don't know if she's here. I don't think she's here today. But she would be saying, you know, you were the great student, right? But the, but the, but the school wasn't, right, embracing your, uh, we'll call it learning differences, Liz. Learning differences. Right, yes. <laughs> I didn't have Artie as my teacher. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, you know, I'm certainly unqualified to tell schools how to do it. The one thing I, you know, I, I do have some friends who are teachers, and I think that today there is a um, an increased reliance on um, on teaching to test so that students are gonna are, are gonna score well on tests. That it prob is probably to the detriment of of students. Um, I, I don't know the this, this solution to that. I, I certainly think that there should be some measuring of, um, of, of, of how are we doing? How are, how are we teaching our kids? Are they learning? Um, I'm not sure that a standardized test is the, is the right solution to that. I, I, I agree with Liz. I think that um, people clearly at this point, um, it's, it's silly to, to think that people all learn the same. And um, generally, our schools are designed to teach to people who are um, a certain type of learner. And people um, like Liz or myself who, are, who learn differently um, have, a, have a difficult time with that. And, and as a result, in many cases, um, don't, either don't do well in school or don't like going to school. It, uh, I've heard, uh, well, our educational system can sometimes be the highly efficient management of failure. And, and I don't mean this as a slight to any of us that are in education. That is our challenge. The Ohio Department of Education is filled with experts and listening intently to, well, what are the ideas? What do we do? I think that uh, we all have to embrace education as the thing we're supposed to be working on. If we really care what sort of world we leave behind, all the importance is in developing educators to develop uh, engaged students. I'm, I'm, so I'm glad, grateful for your question and, uh, and, and for the next one, please. How has uh, failure and disappointment informed uh, your creativity? You mean right now? <laughs> <laughs> I'm over it, man. Uh, right, right. Okay, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> speaking to them. How has... Uh, Someone else who wants to ask the next question, raise your hand, and then, and then we'll deliver the microphone to you. Good. Okay, but let's answer this one. Failure. Um, I can talk. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to go first? I, I love <laughs> failure. I, I really, really, truly do. It's the only time I'm really learning anything. Um, and I don't really see it as failure. There's, there's tons of disappointments. I have probably too many ideas, and uh, it's, it's good when they don't all work out. So I... I uh, <laughs> um, 
I, I, I have really learned from it. I, I think it's, it's good. It doesn't feel good, but. Um, I, too, have failed miserably and many times. Um, <laughs> we couldn't get the panelists who had uh, <laughs> huge successes. They're busy doing things. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think what's important is to, is to, is to, is to move on, to uh, you know, acknowledge that you've, uh, first admit that you failed and acknowledge that and then uh, own up to it and, and try to learn something, but it's going to happen again. Um, and, and to not be discouraged by it, I think, is the, the biggest thing. Um, is, you know, that um, continue trying. I've heard there are three uh, sequential phases that ha generally happy people go through when faced with failure or crisis or some huge problem. Uh, the first is to feel it emotionally. Oh, boy, disappointment. I wish this had worked. It's not working. Two is to analyze it. All right, what happened here? Objectively, what's really happened here? And three, what good can be salvaged from this? What's the best possible outcome given that that just happened? And I think what ha the more failure you have, as Liz places, I have too many ideas. It's good that they fail. You develop a certain efficiency in learning how to, how to cut your losses and move on and learn something from it. So it's, uh, failure is the first step in success. That's good. Before, uh, before you get up, I, I, I want to thank our panelists, Liz Lesner and Pete Scantlin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you not only for sharing your time today, but for, uh, for what you do to our town. This, you make this a, a fun place to live. Oh, thank, thank you. you.